Ever since I was as young as 10 years old, people have asked me questions like, what will your field of specialization be? 10 years old. Really? Just because people thought I was fairly smart, I was expected to have a field of specialization. Because that's how it is these days, isn't it? If you're smart, you specialize. If you're not, you don't. And I see the same trend amongst almost all of my friends. They're all encouraged to micro-specialize in one incredibly narrow field, be it cancer research or biophotonics or solar cell technology, and do it really early on in life, sometimes even before their teens. So there's an abundance of scientific research to support the perils of the loss of biodiversity and the proliferation of monospecies of crops, like GMO corn and wheat. But I would argue that there's an equal peril to us, as individuals and by extension society at large, not only of the loss of biodiversity, but also the loss of talent diversity. In science, there's new ideas frequently come from the cross-fertilization of two seemingly unrelated fields. A great example of this is Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of the structure of the DNA molecule and was actually originally a physicist. He claimed that his background in physics gave him the confidence to solve problems that biologists thought were unsolvable. Another great example is Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps the world's greatest polymath, being uh, a mathematician, an architect, an engineer, a painter, a philosopher, a writer, a biologist, and a cartographer. How about Michelangelo? He was an artist, an architect, a poet, and an engineer. Galileo Galilei was not only an astronomer, but also a physicist, mathematician, and philosopher. So the question that I would like to pose is, have we, as a society, lost sight of the critical importance of diversification? And could diversification be the lost secret to success and fulfillment that today's youth have been searching for? So the great experiment that I would like to propose to you today is about specialization versus generalization. Specifically, can a young person in today's modern society be a generalist and still make meaningful and innovative contributions to today's society? And like any good scientist, I of course decided to make myself the guinea pig. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about my own experiments in diversification and how over the past four short years, I've been able to dabble in about six completely unrelated fields and have an amazing time while I was at it. So I'd like to start when I was 10 years old. So over the summer break, I was volunteering in a hospital in rural India, and in the middle of my stay there, the H1N1 virus broke out in full force. As a result, I was able to notice something very peculiar. I noticed that many of the prescription drugs that these patients were taking actually had really negative side effects. And 10-year-old me thought, why should something that's supposed to help us actually harm us at the same time? So when I got back to Canada, I looked into this further, and I found that most conventional pharmaceutical drugs are actually indiscriminate killers. So they kill all bacteria, regardless of whether or not it's actually harmful for the body. Of course, this would explain all of the negative side effects. So this piqued my interest in the fields of, of botanical alternatives to conventional antibiotics and potential alternatives to pharmaceutical drugs. And after doing a bit of research, I came up with this idea. And it was an idea for a drug that maybe wouldn't have the same side effects that conventional drugs do, but would still be as effective. So what I did was I contacted all of these different university laboratories and research institutions, and I asked of them if I could work in their laboratories. And the responses I got were pretty similar to, Maya, you're 10 years old, you have great ideas, but you're too young to work in a lab. And I still am today, by the way. So this discouraged me, but not enough to stop me. What I ended up doing was I contacted a variety of local high schools and asked them if I could borrow some equipment from their labs, which was really scary since I was only in elementary school at the time. And what I ended up doing was I set up a microbiology laboratory in my basement. And in that laboratory, I ended up developing a prototype for the world's first intelligent antibiotic that can actually tell the difference between harmful and helpful bacteria, and specifically target and kill the harmful bacteria. So. The next year, I was planning on continuing my research in antibiotics. But in the middle of the summer, my grandfather passed away after suffering for years from Alzheimer's disease. So my research interest shifted to focus more on Alzheimer's. And 
As I was doing my research, I came across two very special potential agents. And what made these agents special was that they possessed the rare ability to breach the blood-brain barrier and inhibit what are called amyloid beta plaques in the brain. And these plaques, they characterize Alzheimer's disease. So I thought, hooray, we found a cure. Well, not quite. I remembered that my grandfather, like many other seniors, had very sensitive cardiac and gastrointestinal tract conditions. So he had to be very careful about what medications he took. However, the cardiac and gastrointestinal biosafety of these two drugs had never before been explored. So, in my basement laboratory, I set out, once again, to conduct a series of experiments, this time to confirm the cardiac and gastrointestinal biosafety of the two drugs that I was looking at. So I ended up doing that. And at the same time, I was analyzing my data. And I noticed a very peculiar trend. And I realized later on that I had actually discovered several new properties of these two drugs, which I then applied to the, to the development of a cardioprotective drug for seniors and athletes. And that research actually ended up winning me the top award at Canada's National Science Fair last year. The next summer, once again, I was planning on continuing my research in Alzheimer's disease. But at the same time, over the summer break, I decided to take a course in calculus, you know, just for fun. <laughs> That's my idea of fun, at least. So in this course, we started talking a little bit about some of the practical applications of calculus. So for example, you can take the derivative of distance to get velocity, and you can take the derivative of velocity to get acceleration. And similarly, you can go the other way around and take the integral of acceleration and get velocity, and the integral of velocity and get distance. So despite the fact that researchers earlier on had published the discovery of the derivatives of distance, which are jerk and jounce, it really surprised me that no one had ever bothered to measure the integral of distance. So I thought challenge accepted and I developed the world's first device capable of measuring the time integral of distance and I became the first person to measure the time integral of distance in a physical setting, which was a pretty major addition to Newton's standard model of fundamental kinematics. So, <laughs> the next summer, I was offered a very unique opportunity and that was the opportunity to travel with an international team of students and researchers to the Canadian and Greenlandic Arctic circles. And there's a picture of one of the beautiful icebergs we saw there. And while I was on this trip, I had the opportunity to speak with Arctic residents whose lives and cultures had been dramatically impacted by climate change. And it absolutely devastated me to see that an entire society could be so changed by climate change, and it certainly was not for the better. And I soon realized that our entire planet would soon have to face the full brunt of climate change if young people didn't act now to turn things around. So I thought about what I could do, and I realized that the best way to share what I had seen is by filming a documentary that aims to highlight the stories of the people who are living in the Arctic and share them with young people and mobilize and empower young people to do something about climate change by changing their personal behavior or having governments change their policies in order to combat climate change. And I'm really excited about this documentary. I've had the uh, fortune of being able to partner with organizations like Microsoft, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, and the Ministry of Education in order to make this documentary a success. So now I'm 15 years old and I'm combining all of my interests in technology and health sciences to start my latest venture. So, you see, a few years ago, I was talking to my family doctor, and out of curiosity, I asked him why he doesn't volunteer with an organization like Doctors Without Borders. And he told me that he wanted to, except the only problem was that he simply didn't have the ability to pack up and leave his family and his practice for uh, weeks or months at a time to volunteer in a faraway country. And I realized that this must be a problem for millions of healthcare workers all around the world. They would volunteer their time only if they had the ability to. So as a solution, I launched my latest technology called Life Short for Live Interactive Field Evaluation, which is a new video conferencing technology that's really different than existing technologies, in that it allows us to provide video conferencing technology that is uh, almost HD quality, even in incredibly low bandwidth situations. And it's simple to use, even for people in developing countries with low tech literacy. So the aim is to create a global resource base of millions of doctors available 24-7 worldwide to provide their expert medical advice anywhere in the world at any time. So I've currently partnered with organizations like the African Medical and Research uh, Foundation, as well as uh, Localex to provide increased access to medical care in developing regions in Africa as well as India. So my latest activity, if you will, is becoming the vice president of a national nonprofit organization called Science Expo Canada in order to share my love of science with more students across the country. So Science Expo, 
um, is actually a um, is, it has provided outreach to over 60,000 students across the country and aims to foster a greater awareness of STEM uh, and appreciation of STEM amongst high school students. So Science Expo has already helped thousands of high school students participate in more STEM activities and more STEM programs and will soon be expanding to several chartered locations across the globe very soon. So, is diversification the secret to success? Well, my personal experiment isn't quite over yet, so I can't say for sure. But what I can tell you is that my field hopping over the past four short years, from microbiology to Alzheimer's disease to fundamental physics to climate change to international medical aid, and most recently to STEM outreach, has been an absolute blast. I have met some of the most amazing people, and in some very minor ways, I've been able to contribute to the advancement of a variety of fields and causes, which has all been incredibly exciting, and I would say would have been impossible had I chosen to micro-specialize in one field, just as everyone expected me to. So I would argue that there is, among youth today especially, there's an unnecessary uh, and excessive focus on specialization. And while specialization may be useful in some circumstances, I would argue that there is indeed a very useful place and a great need for more generalists in today's society. And being a generalist is just plain fun. Now perhaps that's an idea worth spreading. <laughs>